The Tomb of Sarah by F. G. Loring My father was the head of a celebrated firm of church restorers and decorators about sixty years ago. He took a keen interest in his work and made an especial study of any old legends or family histories that came under his observation. He was necessarily very well read and thoroughly well posted in all questions of folklore and medieval legend. As he kept a careful record of every case he investigated, the manuscripts he left at his death have a special interest. From amongst them I have selected the following as being a particularly weird and extraordinary experience. In presenting it to the public, I feel it is superfluous to apologize for its supernatural character. My Father's Diary 1841 June 17th. Received a commission from my old friend Peter Grant to enlarge and restore the chancel of his church at Hagerstone in the wilds of the West Country. July 5th. Went down to Hagerstone with my headman, Summers. A very long and tiring journey. July 7th. Got the work well started. The old church is one of special interest to the antiquarian, and I shall endeavor, while restoring it, to alter the existing arrangements as little as possible. One large tomb, however, must be moved bodily ten feet at least to the southward. Curiously enough, there is a somewhat forbidding inscription upon it in Latin, and I am sorry that this particular tomb should have to be moved. It stands amongst the graves of the Kenyans, an old family which has been extinct in these parts for centuries. The inscription on it runs thus, Sarah, 1630. For the sake of the dead and the welfare of the living, let this sepulchre remain untouched and its occupant undisturbed till the coming of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. July 8th. Took counsel with Grant concerning the Sarah tomb. We are both very loath to disturb it, but the ground has sunk so beneath it that the safety of the church is in danger. Thus we have no choice. However, the work shall be done as reverently as possible under our own direction. Grant says there is a legend in the neighborhood that it is the tomb of the last of the Kenyans, the evil Countess Sarah, who was murdered in 1630. She lived quite alone in the old castle, whose ruins still stand three miles from here on the road to Bristol. Her reputation was an evil one even for those days. She was a witch or werewoman, the only companion of her solitude being a familiar in the shape of a huge Asiatic wolf. This creature was reputed to seize upon children, or, failing these, sheep and other small animals, and convey them to the castle where the countess used to suck their blood. It was popularly supposed that she could never be killed. This, however, proved a fallacy, since she was strangled one day by a mad peasant woman who had lost two children, she declaring that they had both been seized and carried off by the countess's familiar. This is a very interesting story, since it points to a local superstition very similar to that of the vampire, existing in Slavonic and Hungarian Europe. The tomb is built of black marble, surmounted by an enormous slab of the same material. On the slab is a magnificent group of figures. A young and handsome woman reclines upon a couch. Round her neck is a piece of rope, the end of which she holds in her hand. At her side is a gigantic dog with bared fangs and lolling tongue. The face of the reclining figure is a cruel one. The corners of the mouth are curiously lifted, showing the sharp points of long canine or dog teeth. The whole group, though magnificently executed, leaves a most unpleasant sensation. If we move the tomb, it will have to be done in two pieces, the covering slab first and then the tomb proper. We have decided to remove the covering slab tomorrow. July 9th, 6 p.m., a very strange day. By noon, everything was ready for lifting off the covering stone, and after the men's dinner, we started the jacks and pulleys. The slab lifted easily enough, 
though it fitted closely into its seat and was further secured by some sort of mortar or putty which must have kept the interior perfectly air-tight. None of us were prepared for the horrible rush of foul, moldy air that escaped as the cover lifted clear of its seating, and the contents that gradually came into view were more startling still. There lay the fully-dressed body of a woman, wizened and shrunk and ghastly pale, as if from starvation. Round her neck was a loose cord, and, judging by the scar still visible, the story of death by strangulation was true enough. The most horrible part, however, was the extraordinary freshness of the body. Except for the appearance of starvation, life might have been only just extinct. The flesh was soft and white, the eyes were wide open, and seemed to stare at us with a fearful understanding in them. The body itself lay on mould, without any pretense to coffin or shell. For several moments we gazed with horrible curiosity, and then it became too much for my workmen, who implored us to replace the covering slab. That, of course, we would not do, but I set the carpenters to work at once to make a temporary cover, while we moved the tomb to its new position. This is a long job, and will take two or three days at least. July ninth, 9 p.m. Just at sunset we were startled by the howling of, seemingly, every dog in the village. It lasted for ten minutes or quarter of an hour, and then ceased as suddenly as it had begun. This, in a curious mist that has risen round the church, makes me feel rather anxious about the Sarah tomb. According to the best established traditions of the vampire-haunted countries, the disturbance of dogs or wolves at sunset is supposed to indicate the presence of one of these fiends, and local fog is always considered to be a certain sign. The vampire has the power of producing it for the purpose of concealing its movement near its hiding place at any time. I dare not mention or even hint my fears to the rector, for he is, not unnaturally perhaps, a rank disbeliever in many things that I know from experience are not only possible but even probable. I must work this out alone at first, and get his aid without his knowing in what direction he is helping me. I shall now watch till midnight, at least. 10.15 p.m. As I feared and half expected, just before ten there was another outburst of the hideous howling. It was commenced most distinctly by a particularly horrible and blood-curdling wail from the vicinity of the churchyard. The chorus lasted only a few minutes, however, and at the end of it I saw a large, dark shape, like a huge dog, emerge from the fog and lope away at a rapid canter towards the open country. Assuming this to be what I fear, I shall see it return soon after midnight. 12.30. I was right. Almost as midnight struck, I saw the beast returning. It stopped at the spot where the fog seemed to commence, and lifting up its head, gave tongue to that particularly horrible long-drawn wail that I had noticed as preceding the outburst earlier in the evening. Tomorrow I shall tell the rector what I have seen, and if, as I expect, we hear of some neighboring sheepfold having been raided, I shall get him to watch with me for this nocturnal marauder. I shall also examine the Sarah tomb for something which he may notice without any previous hint from me.